It does not say fear me. It does not say wonder at me. It does not say understand me, but it says to us, think of life. Think of the privilege of life. Think how great a thing life may be made. What makes membership in a congregation so very special is that we muster strength in togetherness for listening to a voice that is very hard to listen to. It does not, not matter how beautiful the voice's message is about the preciousness of life, for with the voice comes the necessary loss of illusions that we have about the permanence of the things of life that we have grown accustomed to, attached to. The voice calls us to see them as they are, imperfect, fragile, fleeting. And this is so very hard emotionally to do. So we create a space where what is so emotionally hard to do alone, we do it together so we can do it together. Together we do what the poet Carl Sandburg says, gather the stars. Gather the songs and keep them. Gather the faces of women. Gather for keeping years and years. And then together, we loosen hands and let go and say goodbye. Let the stars and the songs go. Let the faces and the years go. Loosen hands and say goodbye. I am so grateful for membership in congregational community where we are made resilient for this spiritually paradoxical task of gathering and loosening, gathering and loosening. Through membership, a person is literally declaring for themselves this, how the community represents, as I mentioned a moment ago, our deepest values and highest aspirations which they want to gather to themselves and to all those people they love. How this community supports them in life and they want it to be the place where they are remembered in their death. And here are their people. Membership declares that too. Here are my people. The people I am going to promise something to. To support them in their living. And I promise to remember them in their dying and to learn how to say goodbye. The ultimate expression of this is the memorial service, the gathering of stars and songs and faces, the loosening of hands, letting go and saying goodbye. The ceremony unfolds, and we Unitarian Universalists call it a celebration of life, not just because Death is what gives life meaning and urgency, but also because we must celebrate or acknowledge or witness to the mystery of how any life ultimately defeats nothingness, which it most certainly does. As Unitarian Universalists, we will tell different stories about this. Some Unitarian Universalists will speak of reincarnation, others will speak of there being no afterlife at all. But the one story we can all share in the telling of is how light sent from a star that has long since collapsed continues shining and streaming, and how actions of people who have long since died still reverberate and still influence our world. To paraphrase the Reverend Peter Rabel, foundations have been laid, which we did not build. Fires have been lit, which we did not light. Trees have been planted. We didn't plant them. Wells have been dug, which we did not dig. Any person who has lost a loved one knows that this is true, that death does not end a relationship so much as inaugurate a new beginning for it, a new way of growing through it, a new way of appreciating it. Death is not an end, it is a doorway. And this is the mystery 
which Unitarian Universalists celebrate in their celebration of life memorial services. And lots of storytelling takes place. The focus is not about God. The focus is not about the afterlife or if, or if your life is right with Jesus. It's supposed to be a little bit of laughter from that. Where are y'all? There are no altar calls. The only call is to attend to the story of a precious life that has walked through the doorway of death. The only call is to listen and learn and think of the privilege of life. Think how great a thing life may be made. And then when the service is over and all the punch and finger foods and cookies at the reception have been consumed, you go out into the world and lean into your one wild precious life that you have been given, which by the grace of God you still have. I have officiated at 55 of these services during my 12 years here at UUCA, and right now I want to share with you some of the stories that have called me to live more vibrantly in my own life, and perhaps you will hear that same call too. One story comes from Bill Buckley's memorial in October of 2008. Bill was a detail-oriented, get-stuff-done kind of person, a practitioner of the to-do list, and I personally saw an entire stack of them on the backs of old envelopes. His careful handwriting, small and precise, also detailed lists of things to do and schedules to keep. For example, 9 a.m. UUCA to do inserts for the order of service. Noon, lunch with a friend. 1 p.m., Publix to purchase a cake and some salad fix-ins. <laughs> Home afterwards to wash the laundry and vacuum the floor. Stacks and stacks of these to-do lists, schedules to keep. Phone call scripts. Also, short sayings, which I found written on the backs of these old envelopes. Short sayings like, being discouraged is a luxury I cannot afford. <laughs> or, go to heaven to get my reward? Nonsense. I'm getting my reward here. Good friends, good health, and waitresses that spoil me. <laughs> See, it's stuff like that. You, the, the guy's dead, but you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> or I take, my, I take responsibility for my life as it is now. Or row, row, row your boat, not somebody else's boat. <laughs> or happiness is something you plan on. Or we can learn something from everybody. Then this one, which is classic Bill, where he quotes from the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And then parentheses, he writes, opportunities are everywhere. <laughs> and, then, and then back to the original prayer where there's hatred, let me so love. And following this, he writes all in capital letters, do in calligraphy and send us Christmas cards. He died working, thinking, giving, but quiet and steady behind the scenes as he might have been, he had a definite sense of humor as well as a passion for justice. And with regard to the humor, here's something that Bill wrote in one of those envelopes, a couple things. What do you get when you throw a hand grenade into a French kitchen? The answer, linoleum blown apart. <laughs> Oh, but this is even better. Oh, yeah. Hold on to your hats. This is, uh, this is like uh, rated, uh, um, well, here we go. <laughs> Sex is a misdemeanor. The more you miss, the meaner you get. <laughs> oh, 
That's the Bill Buckley story. And it led me to wonder, what is the eccentricity about me that makes my life sweet and charming? Right? Am I too Puritan and regimented in my world? Are there ways I can just let it all hang out just a little bit more to make life more worth living? You know, stories about Orion Man took me there as well. You remember Orion? He died September of 2018. He will be missed because he never stopped wearing open-toed sandals, <laughs> even when there was ice and snow on the ground. And, no, I'm just, shh. <laughs> shh. I'm getting there. He will be missed because he could be counted on to show up at the annual Inman Park holiday party in his festive Scottish kilt, where he would show off his moves on the dance floor and no doubt show off a bit too much skin, too. <laughs> he will be missed because... He had this habit of going swimming at the public pool, and then right as he was getting into his car on the way home, he'd attach his bathing suit to his car antenna, and by, by the time he arrived, his bathing suit would be all dry. <laughs> we love people, not just because of their grand and glorious things, but also because of their eccentricities, which make them so very endearing. And then there are stories underneath some of these eccentricities, which once you know them, your heart just melts. The story that comes to mind here is from Lorraine Spaulding, whose memorial was smack dab in the middle of my candidating week with you all back in April of 2007. And some of the search team members are shaking their heads because let me tell you, that was throwing something. That was throwing me a fastball, right? Lorraine loved gardening. Her garden was so important to her. And I was told by Karen Lindauer, Karen's out there, right? There she is. That at times, her attention to garden details could lean towards the perfectionistic. One fall day, Karen came over to visit Lorraine at her home, and there was Lorraine picking up the leaves spread all over her yard, one by one, one by one. Now, when Karen looked upon the yard, she saw a million leaves. <laughs> and Karen's like, why bother? <laughs> Don't worry about it. But the details were important to Lorraine. That garden was going to be perfect, no matter what. When Karen shared this with me, a lump, I mean, I was laughing like crazy, but a lump also formed in my throat, and tears started to form in my eyes, because by that time, I had learned something else about Lorraine. Lorraine's birth mother was mentally ill. She had bipolar disorder. And when Lorraine was just six months old, she had Lorraine placed in a foster home for the sake of her safety. And while Lorraine's foster parents loved her and took great care of her, Lorraine grew up feeling a basic insecurity about who she was. Others experienced her as strong and so supportive and caring, but it was only, but it was only after Lorraine died and her diaries came to light that it was clear her inner struggle, her terrible struggles in her youth to feel okay just as she was. Fear was pervasive for her that if she messed up, her foster parents might send her away. After all, she saw foster children like her come and go, come and go. So perhaps the perfectionism that Karen saw one day, that ridiculous perfectionism, and the way she was going to pick up all those leaves, those millions of leaves, one at a time. Well, maybe it was an echo down through the years of Lorraine feeling like she had to work really hard to earn a sense of security in her life. The real question this takes me to is, how compassionate am I with the perfectionism and the other survival strategies I bring to my world, which definitely 
give me an edge of eccentricity, but they're also survival strategies, meaning they worked at one time, but maybe not so much now. Maybe now they are creating unhappiness in my world. Can I create better coping skills? I want that, yes, but I can't dare hate myself for ways I tried to survive bad times. And, and I ask you that as well. Can you acknowledge your survival strategies and balance a desire to evolve more helpful coping mechanisms, even as you honor those old survival strategies. You honor them because they helped you to survive really bad times. What is for sure is that we spiritual beings having a human experience turn our experiences of adversity into a capacity for service. The greatest healers among us have themselves known hurt. The greatest empathizers and listeners among us themselves know firsthand how important it is to be empathized with and listened to. So it is no wonder why Lorraine found herself drawn to counseling as a profession. No wonder she was such a source of stability and strength to so many others. So Lorraine's story urges us to listen very carefully to what Leonard Cohen sings. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That is how the light gets in. On to another story that comes from the life of uh, Joseph Greenberg, who is the Reverend Marty Keller's father. Reverend Marty Keller was an associate minister here at UUCA for many years. Joe died April 2008, and from his service, we heard a great story about his grandmother and how she dealt with an impossible situation. Apparently, <clears throat> Joe's grandmother once told him that he was her absolute favorite grandchild. But completely unknown to him, she went ahead and said the same thing to all the other grandchildren. <laughs> they were all her absolute favorites. But not knowing this, each grandchild would look upon the other with a secret smile, feeling special, feeling favored above all the others. For years, Joe held this feeling close to his heart. It gave him tremendous strength and courage in his life. So you can imagine his surprise when, many years later, in adulthood, Joe's sister came clean and shared the secret that she had kept so successfully for so many years. Not so! Joe shot back. Joe couldn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it until one of his cousins <laughs> disclosed that he was their grandmother's favorite. And this is when his deep sense of irony kicked in, and he realized with appreciation how his grandmother beat the system in a way that worked for all. <laughs> Her offering was by no means perfect, but light got in. Forget your perfect offering. Over and over again, the stories of eccentricity and imperfection that did not prevent success but only prepared the way for it or gave it soulfulness come back to me across the years, across the years. How greatness in our living is about being unreactive and non-anxious about the imperfection, but creating through it, building through it, to a better way. Boyd McCown was so good at this. His memorial service was April of 2018. Once this music educator par excellence was on a trip to New Zealand where he and his partner were touring a middle school and they happened to stop at the music class where the students were playing xylophones but Boyd instantly saw that they were holding the mallets all wrong. But instead of pointing it out to, in front of everybody and shaming the teacher, Boyd simply went up to one of the students and said, could I try that? He took her mallets and he started playing. And the teacher realized, oh, they've been holding them incorrectly. 
and he played a little bit with the students, and then he walked out of the door. And that's that. I want to frame that story and put that on my wall. That is what astonishingly great leadership looks like. Leadership which is not about one's ego. It's not narcissism. It is about the good of all. And then there's the great leadership of Ed Mangiafico Jr. in the manner of managing his own dying. The imperfection that life put before him was brain cancer. His service was in March of 2018, and one of the readings he absolutely wanted to have in his service was Billy Collins' poem entitled, The Lanyard. Do you know that poem, The Lanyard? Some of you may. A lanyard is a cord or a strap that you wear around your neck to carry such items as keys or identification cards, right? It's not a big deal, right? Got it. The poem is about the complete cluelessness of the child who makes a lanyard for his mother at summer camp and presents it to her like it is the most precious sacrifice imaginable. And so the poem, she gave me life and milk from her breasts and I gave her a lanyard. <laughs> Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing. And here is a good education. And here is your lanyard, <laughs> I said. <laughs> For me, the real question is, how can someone who is enduring something as grim as brain cancer muster up any appreciation for the wry wit of this poem? How can he be laughing? Or more to the point, how do you live every day, every moment, without allowing the knowledge of your inevitable death to spoil all those preceding moments? Ed has something to teach all of us about how healing the spirit can still happen even in the face of inevitable death. The fact is, he said in 2016, that getting my head around the illness, so to speak, brain cancer. Hey. Just don't throw things, all right? Come on. <laughs> Getting my head around this illness, so to speak, has opened a window of opportunity for me to embrace honesty in and dedication to our relationship better than at any point over the seven plus years since we met. He is saying that to his wife, Barbara. And then he says something that appears meant for everyone, for you and for me, saying it in his funny and witty way, I'd recommend couples counseling before jumping off the brain tumor bridge to get this done, but you might consider getting it done before something bites you in the ass. That's what he said. Yeah, I said that word. First time I read that, I just exploded and laughter was so funny, and then, and then I sighed. I mean, I wish it, it could be so. I wish that each of us, myself included, could be more proactive about being more vulnerable, more open, more available to the people we love without adversity as the trigger. And yet so often we are not. Forget your perfect offering. We are grateful for Ed, for the example of his life where he teaches us that true wellness is not necessarily an absence of pain or illness. It is about the presence of larger vision and meaning. Physical suffering is just not the worst thing that can happen to us. The worst thing that can happen is to stop living, to stop trying, to stop loving when there is yet more time available to live and to love and to try. In wholeness is the meaning of our lives. And you can be whole even if you are ill or even if you're just temporarily abled, right? Knowing that your ability is just temporary. You can still be whole, and wholeness is the meaning of our lives, and wholeness. It is about the hope and the purpose that will get us up out of bed each morning, and suddenly, the why question that we shake like a fist at God or at the universe, that why question changes because who can tell why bad things happen? 
Who can tell with certainty why this person gets cancer and this person does not and whatever else, the, whatever else happens in our lives? There's all sorts of theories, but we can't know for sure. We must feel our anger. We must feel our grief. We cannot cut ourselves off from that. But when we have felt our anger and our grief enough and we sense that there is another step we can take, perhaps that step is to ask a different question. Not why, but what now? What is next? How we respond is up to us. The what now, that is in our control, even if the occurrence of cancer in our bodies or some other kind of fragility is not in our control. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That is how the light gets in. So ring the bells that still can ring. And now it is past time for me to end. So many more stories gathered so many more stars and songs and faces, but now we must loosen hands, let go, and say goodbye. So goodbye, Bill Buckley. Goodbye, Orion Mann. Goodbye, Lorraine Spaulding. Goodbye, Joe Greenberg. Goodbye, Boyd McCown. Goodbye, Ed Mangiofico, Jr., Goodbye to so many others. Thank you for laying the foundations which we are building on. Thank you for lighting the fires which we are warming ourselves by. Thank you for planting the trees whose shade we enjoy. Thank you for digging the wells which we drink from. And thank you, UUCA for sustaining this community with your time and energy and money so that there is a community to be a member of, lasting over the years, generating so many blessings, which are beautiful legacies we are receiving right now. Hear the voice of death. It does not say, fear me. It does not say, wonder at me. It does not say, understand me. It says... Think of life. Think of the privilege of life. Think how great a thing life may be made.